So in, in late 2017, um, in the Department of Justice, um, I had been putting out feelers, interested in doing an overseas detail, um, and was interested in, in you know, going to one of the interesting areas of the world. And somehow, shape or form, I found myself uh, volunteering to go to Afghanistan for the Department of Justice. Um, one of the positions open was the Justice Attaché, or the legal advisor to the ambassador of um, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. His name was John Bass. And so I applied for the position. I was selected. And uh, my wife, Amy, is, is pretty used to me, you know, trying to do maybe some crazy things. But when I told her that, uh, that I had volunteered to go to Afghanistan, she really did think I'd kind of lost my mind. Um, but, it, but it was an honor to be selected by the department. And uh, part of the mission, going there as the Justice Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, you become part of the United States mission in that country to nation build, to build the economy, to build agriculture, to build education. And my lane of travel was the rule of law, building the, uh, the judicial and prosecutorial landscape, helping the Afghans build that, that part of their country that we have now been doing this for over 18 years to the tune of about um, $900 billion. And, and I did say $900 billion with a B that uh, we have, U.S. taxpayers have expended in Afghanistan over the last uh, nearly 20 years. Um, the U.S. mission does this, um, produces uh, and pushes the, the, uh, the, the building country of Afghanistan to do this under a democratic sort of rule of law, a democratic way of life. And so there's lots of prerequisites for the Afghans to receive our dollars, they have to sort of follow our U.S. lead. And so I was um, privileged to be part of that mission uh, working with John Bass in Afghanistan. Um, I'll uh, make sure this is hit my. There we go. Let's see, you're trying to. There we go. Moving a little slower. Um, first, let me say that uh, my hero is uh, my wife, uh, Amy Featherston. She is a nurse practitioner and in between working has been volunteering out at the uh, mobile testing site at the airport. And uh, she's braver than uh, most people I know. And so instead of wearing a, a flak jacket as a police officer or a helmet and a bunker coat as a fireman, she dons this mask and helmet every Thursday and Friday to uh, go out there and um, stick long sticks up people's noses. So um, I'm very proud. And she was also the one who supported me while I was in Afghanistan and took care of the house. And uh, more importantly, took care and kept the kids in line while I was gone. And, and, and to be honest, they did a great job. Uh, they were uh, fantastic and supported me while I was gone. All right, I'm getting used to this. Uh, make sure it changes screens here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so to understand Afghanistan, um, I, I think it's real. Most people will tell you to understand Afghanistan, you have to understand the geography. And Afghanistan has numerous neighbors around it, all these very friendly neighbors like Iran and China and Pakistan and the stands, what we call the stands, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan. And so uh, these friendly neighbors that, that surround Afghanistan over the last several thousands of years um, have always sought to destabilize Afghanistan um, every day. And so it makes it a very critical part uh, of the world in a sense that uh, the United States has an opportunity to have air bases, to have a national security presence in that country, which was one of the reasons after the, the in, we invaded Afghanistan in 2001, that was one of the reasons that we maintained a presence in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is about the size of Texas, about 250,000 square miles. And, um, but imagine Texas as your hand and, and your fingers being the various mountain ranges, the Himalayas, the Caucasus, the Hindu Kush. These are very tall, 
mountains that have dictated the political environment, the war, the war footing environment in Afghanistan for thousands of years. Um, I took that picture on the, what is the, the more brown picture on the left um, when I was on one of my flights in Afghanistan. Um, it's a very rough country, very uh, cold in, in the northern, cold and wet in the northern part, very hot and dry in the southern part. Um, it's a, uh, the, the country is made up of various tribes, very tribal, 40% being the, the very conservative Pashtuns, and then a variety of other tribes, the Tajiks, Hazaras, the Uzbeks, that make up the rest of the country. Um, they are the minority. And uh, in every sense of the word, majority, minority, the Pashtuns um, have been fighting these other tribes for a very long time and been trying to kill these other tribes for a very long time. And then the United States government, as well as the international donor community comes in and in a process of nation building requires that the government work together with all these various tribal entities. Um, that doesn't always work very well. Most of the time, it does not work very well since essentially over thousands of years, these tribes have tried to kill each other and now we require them to sit by each other every day. Um, Afghanistan has approximately 30 to 35 million uh, people in it, but no one really knows because over the last 50 years of uh, it being involved in, in some type of war or another, they've never been able to actually take a census. It never made sense uh, during uh, the last 20 years to send um, census takers out into the country when they're having to fight the Taliban and ISIS in the process. So no one really knows. We, we gauge our na na nation building support based on estimations. And so that's, uh, that, that makes it a little difficult when you're building a nation. This photograph I took out of uh, an armored land cruiser um, I thought it was every time you enter the city of Kabul, you enter into a, uh, a traffic jam. It's a city built for 400,000, but it currently houses over 4 million people because of uh, the, the war outside of the cities going on that pushed the populations into the cities. Three-fourths of all people in Afghanistan do not have basic running water or electricity. Who can guess what the Afghanistan's national crop of choice is? Ah, yes, uh, heroin, heroin, growing poppies. 65% um, of the country control, the 65% of the, the country is controlled by the Taliban and the Taliban receives the bulk of its financial support from the cultivation and sale of heroin that primarily goes to Europe Australia, and uh, other parts of the Eastern Bloc. Now, you can't, to understand what goes on in Afghanistan today, if you read any of the books about Afghanistan, you have to understand that everything derives from its history. And so if we look back, going back 2,000 years, from Alexander the Great, through Genghis Khan, through the 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 twice attacked by the Russians and the Soviets. Um, most of the time, the Afghans, pardon my French, have kicked these nations' asses um, multiple times. Um, only one to somewhat survive was the Mongol invasion of Genghis Khan, who actually, if you look at that top picture, that is the Balahasar. And I had the occasion to fly over this, this old fort on numerous occasions. And I always wanted to, to go visit it, but I was never allowed to because of the security <clears throat> environment. But the Balahasar housed uh, Genghis Khan and his elephants during one of the Mongol uh, wars when he would uh, use uh, elephants to to uh, part of his invading force. So I was always uh, just wish I could have uh, visited the fort every time I would fly over it. And th the bottom picture is, is of what it looks like today. But um, everyone on that list has, has been housed, including the United States military has been housed in, the, uh, in that fort to date. These, the country of Afghanistan suffering through all the wars that it has, um, essentially knows no other time other than um, a fairly quiet time between 1900 and about the 1970s prior to the Soviet invasion in 1979. Anyone alive today 
uh, in Afghanistan really <clears throat> essentially knows no peaceful time um, in that country. Now, while working at the embassy, you have to sort of uh, kind of uh, think about the U.S. Embassy as the size of Lamar, think of Lamar University, and then put a wall down, the, surround it with a 20-foot high Constantine wire wall, about five feet thick of, of cement called T-walls, and then draw a line down the middle of the, the, the campus, and one side of that campus being the NATO base called Resolute Support, and the other side being the U.S. Embassy side. We had access to both sides of, of that, and it houses on the embassy side approximately three to 3,500 people at any given time. So imagine, and all of those individuals all carrying guns, all of them carrying weapons. Um, so it's kind of like a college campus with everybody carrying guns. Uh, on occasion, we did get uh, uh, first-run movies ahead of time that would be played in a, in a uh, meeting area that we could attend. Uh, there were two liquor stores. Um, amazingly, it, no one really understood why there were two liquor stores, and you had a limit of uh, one bottle of hard liquor per day or two bottles of wine. Um, that kind of sounds like a COVID pandemic style uh, living, but uh, um, it, it it always surprised me why they had that limit. The, the military, the U.S. military, general order number one is no liquor. No, uh, soldiers cannot drink in a war zone. And so having two liquor stores on the embassy side always caused uh, lots of issues with the, uh, the military wanting to come over and partake. The, uh, if anybody can get, guess what general order number two is, one is, in, one is liquor, the other is um, soldiers are uh, forbidden from having sex. So that, that was always another issue that soldiers would come onto the embassy side and try to find uh, uh, places to visit. Um, and uh, so there's always, always issues between the two sides of the campus. Um, to being uh, of the 3,500 people in that embassy at any given time, two thirds of those individuals are security forces. So you always had a gym to go to. Um, and if you could, uh, the, the pollution is, is very bad in Afghanistan. Pollution is very bad in Kabul, Afghanistan. So most people jogged with mask on. Um, so the masking, uh, they were pretty ready. They were made uh, ready for the pandemic ahead of time. So that was pretty much uh, the, the playtime. The picture you see on the right-hand side is the national sport of Afghanistan called Bazkashi. And um, it's sort of a, imagine rugby played on horseback uh, where the ball is a, uh, a starts out to be a live goat, which turns out to be a dead goat, and uh, each team fights to drag the dead goat onto uh, their across their goal line. So you can see in that picture the one of the players is reaching down trying to get the goat into the dirt. Uh, but I thought that was a, a fantastic picture that uh, I bought actually in a market there in Afghanistan. Afghan life. Now, I find this one of the most fascinating things about Afghanistan and gives you a real insight into the Afghan mentality. Um, a, a, being a, a extreme conservative Sunni uh, um, culture, um, it, over the history that, that women's rights have been very minimal. And even w over the last 20 years since the United States has been part of this process of, of rebuilding this nation, Part of the insistence of the United Na the the international core as well as the United States is for women's rights to be established. That women have the right to work, they have the right to vote, they have the right to go and 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 come as they please. This has been a very difficult task. Um, at the the culture of of men and women in Afghanistan is still a very difficult thing to correct. Uh, women, um, if they are at a bus stop by themselves, they will be sexually harassed. Um, even of the the about a thousand Afghans who work in the U.S. Embassy every day, if a female Afghan wins an award. And uh, 
and treat her very, very poorly. And uh, we'll curse her, we'll call her very bad names. And we, uh, on occasion, you, it's very common to have to fire or, or kick uh, certain male Afghans out of the embassy and fire them after these events happen. But in the community, especially outside of the cities, women's rights are uh, still um, at risk. And so it's a, a very tough time, especially as we insist on women being able to be judges and prosecutors and other occupations um, based on our, our US mission of rebuilding that nation. It is still resisted to this day in spite of $900 billion in at nearly 20 years of attempting to uh, rebuild this nation. A good example of Afghan life is if you ask a 15 year old, what, what does he look forward to in his life? What does he want to be in the future? Does he want to be a pilot? Does he want to be an electrician? And th those thoughts are never, never enter into the average 15 year old boy's uh, mind um, in Afghanistan. He is taught from a very young age that the only and number one thing that you are to do when you get older, become an adult, is to get married. And so the Afghan young male, this is all he has been trained by his parents and by his grandparents and by his culture is to think and dream of getting married. And so this is a very problematic aspect of the Afghan life because there's, there's no um, pushing of young Afghans to seek certain occupations or to seek uh, rewarding work in their in their future as an adult. Uh, so this is this is one uh, real real troubling spot in Afghanistan. Uh, marriages are always still arranged. They are there's no um, marriage currently. There's no marriage for love in Afghanistan. It's all prearranged marriages by the families. And uh, one of the, when the first night I was flying into Afghanistan, we were late. And so we were on a helicopter flying from the, the uh, airport to the embassy. And it was um, very polluted. And so there was a real thick uh, pollution fog in the air. And we started to land, but there had been a mortar attack on the embassy several hours before, which delayed us. And one of the mortars had been found on the helicopter pad or in the landing zone, which is an old soccer field where we would land. And so the helicopter had to peel away and do a circle around the city. And I noticed as we were circling the city that there was this very bright area, very lit up. It almost looked like the Las Vegas Strip. But yet other parts of, of Kabul were dark because there were, there were no it was not electricity. It, it, they had power outages all the time. And so I finally asked, I said, what was this lighted area that, that we could see? And, that, and they, that's a, a one roadway like the Vegas Strip where there's nothing but wedding venues. Weddings are uh, the, the a number one priority in an Afghan family life. They will save all their life to pay for their children's weddings. And in these wedding venues, there's a, be a giant hall, like I say, a KC hall, for example, and they would draw, uh, put a wall up, they have a wall up down the middle of it. And on one side, the males would dance and partake in the party. And on the left-hand side, the all the females of the family and visitors would partake of dancing and enjoying the party, but never the two shall meet. And that's the, uh, the at once a, a, 15 year old male or a 15 year old female in Afghanistan become of age, um, usually around the age of 13, they are not allowed to be around each other. They, males and females are not, al not allowed to socialize. They're not allowed to date. Um, at that point in time, they're separated in school. They're separated in their, in their culture, in their, in their community. And only until their family arranges the, the marriage will a male and female then come together. So uh, not only do we have to rebuild the, the agriculture, not only do we have to rebuild a lot of other aspects of this country, uh, sort of the title of my, my presentation is Leading the Horse to Water. Uh, these parts of, of the Afghan culture have not changed and, and it, you can see where this causes problems in later maturity and later development in both business, uh, government, and in 
international politics. So my purpose of going there, the, my role was uh, to not only be the, the legal right-hand man of the ambassador of Afghanistan, but the DOJ's role will be to work with the FBI, the DEA, countering terrorism, countering narcotics. And one of the, if you ask Afghans in downtown Afghanistan what, what their biggest threat is, most of them are going to tell you the bombings of, of the Taliban or ISIS is probably number one, but the number two threat to the safety of Afghans is corruption, systemic and endemic corruption that uh, has developed a culture of impunity that is really the biggest threat and which has resulted in the theft and stealing of millions and millions and millions of U.S. dollars over the last 18 years. I'm not sure if I mentioned, but the U.S. government has spent nearly $900 billion over the last uh, 18 years in Afghanistan. Um, and the measurable improvement, ne measurable nation building that's happened is, is still negligible. Uh, so the, um, the, one of the things that comes into Afghanistan um, is the security environment. Nothing is um, achieved unless you can defeat and uh, work with the security environment. Multiple layers of checkpoints because the embassy and the NATO base sit in Afghanistan sits right in the middle of downtown Kabul. So that makes it a, uh, a common target for bombings, suicide bombing, bombers, um, uh, mortars and rockets are fairly common, one to two a, 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 a week. Um, pretty, pretty common occasion. Thank goodness we have great uh, security, um, both from diplomatic security and military security. Um, the picture on your right is what we call PTIDs. Uh, those are giant blimps that are raised uh, very high above the city that have uh, extremely high resolute cameras and uh, sense and warn systems that uh, when, when they hear, when a bomb goes off in the city, cameras will immediately uh, respond and focus on wherever that bombing happened, or if a mortar goes off, uh, they cameras and sensing systems will automatically set off our alarms in the in the embassy, and then you have to respond. You have to either, if you're outside, you have to get on the ground. If you're and get to a bunker. If you're inside, you have to get to a safe room, or uh, you know you put on your flight jacket, you put on your helmets, grab your weapons, and and get to a safe zone whenever these mortars were fired. So imagine if you're going into your business any day, um, you know, when, when we're all back to normal, you're walking into your business and you're about to do a, a business deal and then these alarms go off and it interrupts everything, especially when you, it never fails when you're about to have a, a meeting with uh, Afghan visitors, Afghan officials, never fails. These alarms tend to, to go off. So um, they can be very annoying and uh, because you're trying to work, you kind of get uh, a little bit immune to them. I'm hoping I can make this. Uh, there. Uh, 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 incoming, incoming. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, for those sound effects. Um, so imagine you're, it's, it's either three o'clock in the morning, you're about to walk into a business meeting and this is, this is what happens. In every contained housing unit, your very small box you live in or your apartment has a speaker in it and it will knock you out of bed. Um, what you're hearing in that latter part of that uh, video is what you're seeing is is a um, a weapon, a Gatling gun of type that is responding to that mortar that's incoming. And so you're hearing the sound of that Gatling gun after the fact, after you've seen the tracer rounds uh, trying to hit the, the mortar coming in. Um, these are these are pretty uh, pretty common. This is what we uh, what what everyone in the U.S. State Department and at the embassy and on the on those bases in Afghanistan deal with 
all the time. So then afterwards, you would normally, after you come out of your bunker, take your helmet and your flight jacket off, you're going to pull up your phone and look at, okay, where did it land? Uh, what did anybody get hurt? Was there any, any injury or damage to property? So you'll be looking at this left-hand side, that one uh, text message that would come and tell you what's going on. Another big danger in Afghanistan, probably as dangerous for, for, for us at the embassy, was, again, the pollution. Uh, they tell you to look at this app. Um, this is the worst air in the world um, in the wintertime because Afghans don't have any, normally don't have electricity for electric heat. They normally burn camel dung or trash or anything else they can find to burn for heat. So uh, that creates this pollution sort of in this bowl in the mountains at about 7,000 feet. So it's uh, always, always challenging. Um, we always fly um, because of the security environment, the threat of ISIS and the Taliban uh, doing sticky bombs, doing IEDs. Uh, the State Department has determined it's safer for us to fly anywhere we're going. So on the left is, and all we when you fly, you always have two helicopters if you're going on a mission because if one helicopter goes down, the other one can support it. So this is taking pictures of uh, both on the left hand side of the the my chase helicopter going out to the Bagram Airfield. I think that was going to Kandahar, um, but you always have a, a chase helicopter behind you. Um, it's a uh, it's a different way to travel. Um, I, I enjoyed it um, the first 15 times, and then afterwards, you might be dressed up in a suit to to do business with Afghan officials, and then within you know several seconds of the helicopter, you're climbing on the helicopter, you're covered in dust, you're covered in dirt. So it makes it very challenging, uh, but you still still do your job. Um, another other pictures of the birds. What you see there in the middle are MRAPs. Uh, these are um, mine-resistant vehicles that you may remember some of the uh, the media attention to them during the some of the Afghan wars. Um, these MRAPs cost the taxpayers about 750 to a million dollars a piece, and over the last 18 years, we moved over 12,000 of them to Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, while I was there, you know, the it was open discussion about, you know, how do you get these, these vehicles either back or are we going to donate these to as, as part of the, the uh, military building in Afghanistan, do we give these back to them? And it was determined that they were not, uh, the military was not trustworthy uh, based on the, the, um, the science and um, technology that's in these vehicles. It was determined that they could not give uh, these over to the Afghans with fear that they would end up in the Taliban or ISIS hands or other other uh, adversaries. And so they endeavored to a study on how to bring all these, these MRAPs back. Well, they weigh about 14,000 pounds. And so it was determined that it was too, it would cost about $250,000 a piece to actually move them back to the United States or to someplace else. And so the, the, the determination was to cut them up into pieces or put them in a small group and then drop bombs on them to destroy them. Again, 18 years, $900 billion later, um, and, and yet um, 65, probably closer now to 75% of the country is still controlled by the Taliban. Now you don't go anywhere without your security detail. This was just uh, my guys. If you, all the ones in casual dress and the, the military guys were my guys on the ground in Kandahar. Um, but you can see these are all special. These are all special forces uh, or SEALs or Rangers um, that you see that were part of the security detail. So just going from A to Z, uh, it, was, it was very problematic. And so you try to really be efficient in how you work. So when you're moving around town, by vehicle, this was really, uh, you know, you're always stuck in a traffic jam. And so there was always events. If, if our MRAP hit or armored land cruiser hit another car, there was a, we had a chase car in front of us and a, a follow car behind us and a chase car in front of us. And those cars would stop and hand a card that says, call the U.S. Embassy, we'll pay for the damage to your car. We did not stop in the city because of the fear of suicide bombers, IED, Taliban, and so, but you'd be stuck in traffic. And so your security detail, that's when they earned their money and they were well worth uh, every penny because when this uh, poor 
homeless guy came up to our door, they they were obviously alerted. They were afraid that he was a suicide bomber. They're watching his hand. They're watching what looks like a, a, a cell phone in his hand. What he doesn't, what this guy doesn't realize is, is that my follow car, the follow truck behind us, has jumped out with their M4s and are walking up to him, ready to shoot him. And the guy, my security guy in the vehicle with me in front, sitting in front of me where I shoot this picture, is there's a little porthole and he is yelling at the guy to get away. And then there, we have a translator with us everywhere we go. And the translator is yelling at him, get away, you're about to be killed. Get away, you're about to be killed. So probably one of the most intense moments uh, that I had while, while on the streets. Um, the, the, you know, fortunately, we did not, they did not kill him. Uh, but unfortunately, there's, it says 40% unemployment rate in Afghanistan. Most estimates are really closer to 60 to 70%. And, you know, uh, you would think, you know, $900 billion, 18 years, you would think that if you're going to wave at me, you might maybe use all five fingers. Um, but Nevertheless, uh, we, for some reason, we're still disliked in a lot of, a lot of uh, places in Afghanistan. This was taken when we were making a turn on one of the major streets. Uh, what you see in the middle now is, the, is where we were housed. This is what we call a contained housing unit. When I was promoted to the justice attache position, then I was actually able to move to a small apartment. And you can see the steel that is around each of our small balconies uh, there um, in the in the picture that was off of my balcony and occasionally in the in the spring we would have actually old movies played on a screen there in that in that courtyard uh, at the apartment complex so uh, on a day-to-day -day basis what did I do what what was our mission you know it, really anything the ambassador wanted but within a couple of weeks of arriving in Afghanistan the intercontinental hotel in Kabul was attacked by the Taliban 48 people were killed one of the most interesting things that came out of that attack, um, and I was fortunate enough to go with the FBI out to the Intercontinental Hotel attack afterwards to do interviews uh, with our translators in, in tow, that numerous survivors of this attack survived because they could tie sheets together, and that they could, they, one company had several uh, people there in Afghanistan with on business opportunities, and they had given each of their employees rubber door stops. These people traveled a lot in this part of the world, and so they would put rubber door stops behind their their hotel room doors leading to the hallways. What they found was that the the Taliban, when they were killing people inside this hotel, they would go door to door to door, and they would shoot the door lock and then kick the door. If the door opened, they went in and executed whoever they found in the hotel room. But if they kicked the door and the door did not open, they didn't waste time trying to get in. They just moved on to the next hotel room. So uh, we have actually at our office, we have door stops for active shooters uh, um, instances in our, in our offices around the Eastern District of Texas. And so rubber door stops for $1.95 are pretty, pretty uh, in, easy investment to throw in your suitcase when you're traveling, especially in parts of the world where you may have to worry about somebody gaining entry. Now, the last note on that slide is somebody has to pay. And what I did not know at this point in time, because um, I'd only been in Afghanistan for a couple weeks, but I was working hand in hand with the FBI and they, they were already telling me that they're gonna find some way to blame this attack. Um, on the United States. Shortly thereafter, there was a, a and I'm gonna call him John, uh, I'm gonna give him a, a, a fake name, but John was a former decorated Marine who had just about three weeks earlier arrived in Afghanistan to work for an Afghan security company. The Afghan security company had taken over security for the Intercontinental Hotel attack. He was in charge of setting up security and training security there at the hotel. But again, he'd only been there for about three weeks. He was at the hotel when the attack happened, engaged uh, with the, the Taliban, killed several Taliban in the attack, and escaped from, from the attack. He was brought in. We interviewed him at the hotel. We brought him um, back to the embassy uh, to in interview him. And the, I noticed that the FBI supervisor told him, he said, man, he said, I'm going I'm to give you some good advice here. So you should go get your 
passport, go to the airport, get on a plane, no matter what it costs, and you should leave this country. And he goes, I don't, I don't, he did not understand. He One, he thought his, co his company, Afghan company, was going to protect him. Two, that he didn't think he had done anything wrong and had given a statement through a transla an Afghan translator of one of the Afghan police forces. Uh, we later got a copy of that translation and essentially that translation dipped uh, this John in the grease. It basically the, had him admitting to being negligent in the preparation of security for the hotel. So uh, we warned him and told him quickly, you know, he needed ought to get out of the country. He refused, said that he, the company was going to take care of him. And then within a couple of days, the company had set all his belongings outside the door and locked the doors. We're not letting him into the company. Um, and next thing you know, the police were wanting to talk to him again. Uh, long story short is they, the, we knew from our sources that, that the Afghan prosecutor's office was, were, were after someone to blame for this attack. The Afghan government previously had maintained the security at this hotel. And so they were wanting to find somebody to blame for this attack. And it were already leaking out that there was security malfeasance um, that led to the Taliban being able to attack the hotel. This uh, subject, John, ends up um, having some, some emotional and mental issues. And after a meeting at our office, left the embassy. And a lot of people don't realize that the U.S. Embassy is not a, you have to, you know, we, when we travel to other, other countries, we have to obey the other country's laws. The embassy is not a safe haven. The embassy is, um, and there are strict laws to this effect that, you know, very rarely will an embassy give safe refuge or safe harbor to anyone. Um, so when you see in the movies of the, the after the rob in the bank, they, they run to the U.S. Embassy to, in a foreign country. They run to the U.S. Embassy and get gain access inside. That doesn't happen in real life. So this subject, after he left our the U.S. Embassy, traveled uh, um, to a location where he essentially was putting himself in, a, in harm's way. He, he went and sat in a in Masood circle. And if you Google Masood Circle, it's up from our embassy, and it, uh, it's very commonplace for bombings, attacks. Uh, it's, an, it's a place of opportunity. So um, a uh, friend of mine who had uh, been worked in Houston was the lead, lead diplomatic security officer for the embassy. Along with the FBI, we decided that we would go get him. And so we sent diplomatic security officers out to uh, pick up John and bring him into the U.S. Embassy. I didn't quite understand at the time, um, they, our diplomatic security head did understand at the time that uh, we, were, we were doing, we were essentially creating an international incident. When the uh, Afghan government found out that uh, we were uh, giving him safe harbor, because once we took him in, we could not then throw him back over the wall to be subjected to Afghan uh, prosecution or Afghan laws. And we would have, we would have, a, there's an analysis that goes on on do you, do you allow people to be subject to that international, the other country's laws. And in this case, uh, with the, the poor uh, law enforcement, the poor prosecution capabilities of this country, we would have done everything possible to stop this. But once we took him in, we owned him. And uh, they were demanding his return. They issued a warrant for his arrest. And uh, we were in this every daily in, pro in, in, in negotiations with Afghan prosecutors, who coincidentally I was working with uh, on other business um, as well, trying to work out an agreement to let this guy leave the country. Um, he had attempted, I, I failed to mention that before he went and sat down at Masood Circle, he had attempted to go to the airport and found that his visa had been canceled and was not allowed to board a plane and was almost arrested at the airport but escaped. So uh, this individual lived at the U.S. Embassy for several months um, under our care, which meant we were housing him, feeding him. Uh, we were having to give him medical attention and that his emotional state was becoming more and more precarious. And I wish I could give you a real dramatic end, ending of this, uh, but for various reasons I can't, but 
our our relationships with the prosecutor's office in certain aspects were were damaged because of this, and so it was a process of then they were sort of trying to get back into good graces uh, to do our job with under the rule of law in Afghanistan. So it was one of the first things I fell into that I thought was going to end up costing me my job. Um, thank goodness it didn't. And uh, so one of the next things I um, got to work on was a, a couple of terrorism cases. And this is down in Bagram. And they call the, uh, the, the U.S. building near the prosecution office uh, where we have um, military assistance is um, called the Alamo, which I love that picture. So uh, that's in Bagram. One of the trials that I assisted with, with the Afghan prosecutors, trying to get them to work because of our, our U.S. and international dictate on, on uh, criminal laws and criminal procedure that we require them to follow. If you're going to accept so much of our dollars, you have to follow and accept our, uh, the style of law that we insist on. And so the Afghan government over the last past five years had to had actually approved a criminal procedure code and a, a penal code. And so this was, in the last five years, trying to train their prosecutors. Uh, and their prosecutors are also policemen. They're, they're one and the same. And so trying to train them in uh, voluntariness of confessions, trying to train them in search and seizure procedure is quite challenging. Um, and the intel and the... Uh, expertise level in that world is still very minimal. So it made it very difficult to, to, to do that. It's still an ongoing process. But these two individuals, you're, we were not allowed to shoot pictures, but I uh, confess I did pull out my camera from the hip and that's why I kind of cut off a couple of heads. But I did take pictures of these two individuals who were charged with uh, killing a little girl and killing an, an Afghan national police officer. You'll notice the goggles that they have and that they're not clear. There is some type of paper or paint that has been painted inside those goggles. They're not allowed to know where they are when Taliban are arrested. There are thousands of those in custody, Taliban in custody in Afghanistan. So when they're in custody, they're not allowed to know where they are. So with the hopes of as part of their security, uh, operational security there at the holding facility and at the uh, prosecution unit. Uh, the, as you might imagine, the National Security Prosecution Unit in Bagram is very uh, tightly uh, secured and does, but still suffers from mortar and rocket attacks, uh, pretty common. Uh, these two individuals, um, again, had fired mortars at the Bagram U.S. Air Base, but the mortars went off course and struck a house and killed a little girl. In the process of that investigation, they killed a, an Afghan national police officer that they then threw in the trunk of their car before they were arrested. When they were arrested, they were caught with the, the body in the trunk of the car. So for the several weeks that we were prepping these prosecutors to put on their, their to their three judge panel, I a, a thousand times said, make sure you focus on the body, right? You know, what, what better evidence than you got two admitted Taliban to um, in possession of an Afghan national police officer's body. And that we'll worry, you know, well, as part of the, the prosecution strategy, let's focus on that. But I spent three, three to four days uh, with these prosecutors and these judges solely focusing on the voluntariness of these guys' confessions. And it wasn't just because of the prosecutors, um, minimal experience, but it was because of the judges, it was, it was because I was in the room um, and it was because they were trying to demonstrate, they know that we, we uh, our search and seizure, our uh, Fifth Amendment, uh, our, our value of our um, protections of the right uh, to not um, incriminate yourself these are so valuable to us. And so they recognize that they know that from their training. So they were trying to focus on it for my purpose. And so it was a little, a little uh, kind of backwards on, on how this went down. They were convicted, but an appellate court uh, several months later, re excuse me, released uh, them from uh, custody and granted them a new trial. Uh, they're still in custody. Last I heard in Afghanistan. 
this is an old former Russian outpost uh, where um, next to this was a field where over uh, 6,000 Afghan um, bodies, the bones were, were dug up about three years ago um, that were killed by the, during the Russian invasion in the 80s. When you're working with the Afghans, you gotta, you gotta eat nuts and fruits and then you have to drink really bad tea and then everything they do gets delayed, delayed, delayed for the purpose of uh, protecting someone. Just some pictures. I was on the Afghan first responder uh, EMS team for, uh, uh, that was kind of one of the things I did on the side while I was there. And that was one of my, one of the units we worked off of. That was a lot of fun. And then again, there was a, we had several other attacks. I was stuck in a, a coffee shop uh, with some British colleagues um, during Christmas Eve attack, very big attack back then. Uh, one point I wanted to, this is uh, the Attorney General of Afghanistan, um, Hamidi, and uh, this is another issue that I, that I have quite the issue with, that uh, if you're going to have, if we're going to support uh, Afghanistan's government and the development of their government and who they pick for their positions, um, Attorney General Hamidi lives in a very nice house um, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And every time, usually when we try to get a, a set up a meeting with him to work on legislation to outlaw uh, child sex abuse, we usually find, found him to be at his house in Massachusetts. So that's a, 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 another big issue that we have when, when the Attorney General of Afghanistan spends more time in the United States than I did, um, we've, we've kind of lost our way with priorities. And, uh, but one of the problems is, is to get these people to agree to potentially put their lives at risk for four years as the Attorney General of Afghanistan, we have to make concessions that they won't have to live in Afghanistan after their, their term is, is over with. It's messed up. It's messed up and, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it, it's still a, a, a very complicated situation when you're there. Working uh, with the Afghan parliament, uh, outlawing the child abuse of, of uh, it's it, up until recently was still legal. Again, almost 20 years, $900 billion. And it wasn't until 2018 that the uh, criminal act of Bachibazi was outlawed, which is the uh, use of little boys in sex acts. This uh, from, the picture on the bottom of this slide is taken from my balcony over a hill that's near near downtown um, Kabul. Um, that is a pool on top of that hill that the Russians built during the Russian era for exercise. After the, the Russians were run out of um, Afghanistan in 1989, the Taliban executed nearly 700 women in this pool by pushing them off the, the high dive. Um, the Taliban have not changed. Um, other than they are more a drug cartel now as much as they are an ideological right-winged um, terrorist organization. So uh, as we all know that we are in these are just some, I thought, I love the picture of the Ford F-250 with the uh, 30 caliber machine guns mounted. These are, uh, the picture on the right is I'm turning, my, my convoy is turning into a prosecution unit outside of Kabul after flying in. We got in the land cruiser as we're turning in. Our security guards at the gate are asleep in this Humvee. And uh, you can see they put up cardboard to block the heat that, that's coming in through their windows. Uh, but I thought that was fascinating. Um, the Afghanistan just had their, it, it, they're two years late, but they just had their, their second or third presidential elections where the, uh, ruling party, the Pashtuns and the, uh, secondary party, um, did not agree with the election results. It's still in, in being contested. So what do you do when your election is contested? You, one president, President Ghani, who was the, the incumbent, claimed that he was the winner. So he had his uh, um, party 
and his uh, swearing in ceremony and then the competitor, his, uh, his competitor in the presidential race, Abdullah Abdullah, also next door had his own uh, swearing in ceremony, both as president. So as it sits right now, if you accept the uh, election results or uh, the election process, now we have two presidents of Afghanistan and neither one of them will speak to each other. Uh, and that's what's currently going on there. Despite the uh, process of uh, peace process that has been under negotiations for a couple of years now where we've announced some success, uh, the Taliban continue to execute attacks and bombings on this country. Uh, matter of fact, during President Ghani, Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah's swearing in parties and ceremonies, there was a rocket attack. Um, it, no one knows whether it was ISIS or, or the Taliban. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's quite ironic that uh, we're entering into peace negotiations with the very group that gave um, the Al-Qaeda killers safe refuge in Afghanistan in 2001. And uh, those, this terrorist organization is now who we're, uh, we're, we're cutting deals with and seeking a peace process. I understand it because it's time for the United States, in Brit's opinion, not anybody else's, not the U.S. government's opinion, but in Brit's opinion, the United States needs to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, that um, it is, uh, it, in 20, 2013, we had 140,000 U.S. troops and corresponding NATO troops. Now we have about 7,000. If we couldn't do it uh, with 140,000 troops, we're definitely not going to be able to do it with seven to 8,000, and we're, we're pulling out more and more. So it's, a, it, it's still a crisis zone. Only a, a recent poll showed that only 50% of Americans realize that we're still fighting a war in Afghanistan and still have such a huge presence there, uh, but we do. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex quagmire that, uh, that uh, last 18 years has not been able to uh, reduce the amount of corruption and uh, the number of millionaires that Afghan millionaires have been been made by uh, U.S. and international donor dollars is just uh, exhausting. And so we uh, it's time to, to take a different strategy um, in the future there in Afghanistan. And anyway, I'm coming to the end. Jackie, I know you're doing your hands across your throat. Shut up, Britt. Um, but I'm willing to take any questions if I didn't go too far. Um, uh, and and thank y'all so much for letting me uh, come back and finish. It's uh, glad to be glad to be able to do it, and I was actually able to rework a little bit of this before I did. So it's been an honor to be back with all the great great people in Southeast Texas. Um, I actually uh, think I may have a, a brother or two that might have actually been dialed in listening. So a shout out to to those those brothers. Uh, one last thing is that um, you know. You know, the hair salons, the nail salons, the tanning beds, the waxing, all those are shut down. Now, man, it's really about to get ugly in here, isn't it? And I'll leave you with that. Uh, and, you know, you can say there's so many coronavirus jokes, it must be a pandemic. So uh, with a hey. bad joke. <laughs> that's it, Jackie, Joe, thank you very much. And I'm glad to take any questions you might have. Okay. Let's uh, see here. Uh, we've got about a little extra 10 minutes or so. Um, so let's just see if there's a couple of uh, individuals. I'll tell you what, why don't we uh, see if anyone would stay behind and, uh, and you would be willing to, uh, to, to uh, uh, answer questions and, and let's do it that way. Okay? Glad to do it, Joe. Thank you. You got it. So Let's uh, go ahead and let me uh, go down through here and, and, and uh, let you know uh, we do. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Britt, for visiting us again. Um, you've earned a, a special recognition for us, I will let you know. You're the only speaker that, uh, that we know who has asked to speak to the club twice in one year. And you got it. You did it. We enjoyed having you uh, both times. Uh, they're very interesting. And uh, the express of our appreciation, uh, once again, we will make a donation in your name to the Rotary Foundation's End 
Polio Now campaign. I appreciate that uh, very much, uh, Rick. Um, let's see here. I want to uh, indicate too that I believe that we have a, a quick uh, announcement from Deborah Drago. Deborah? Thank you, Mr. President. So grab your favorite Mexican cuisine and your favorite Mexican beverage at Casa del Zoom on Tuesday, May 5th from 5.30 to 7. Let's connect for a virtual Cinco de Mayo Rotary After Hours and what I'm sure will be a Rotary happy and comedy hour with friends. So, viva Rotary. All right, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And once again, let me just say happy birthday for you for today being your day. Thank you so much. Yep. So thank you uh, all all of you for attending the meeting today. And as our tradition, uh, we're gonna let uh, close the meeting uh, to say that uh, the four-way test is becoming uh, a thing at the very end. But let me just also indicate too, that uh, if you are interested uh, and if you would wanna hang along, uh, I think you could add, uh, get Brett to get any other questions that uh, he would be able to take care of with you. Let me ask you, Jack, Jackie, we have enough time for this, for that? I yes, guess. sir, I think so. Okay, we're good now. So anyone who wants any more in, uh, to get some more information from, from Britt, and there's some interesting things that he gave us, hang along, hang in and in, in here, and, and uh, we'll ask some questions. So now at this point, uh, let's just say that uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who has been here today. And as our tradition, uh, let's close our meeting by saying, the four-way test of the things that we think, stay, say, or do. And uh, those who want to stay, welcome to stay. So first. Is it the truth? Okay, is there a second? Fair dog. Third. Will it build good goodwill and better, better friendships. friendships. And fourth. Will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? Thank all of you, have a good week. Uh, go out and connect the world and ring the bell, but we're going to stay and see if there's any of you that would like to have any more information and, and, and learn more about what it's the things that Brett has said. So thank you very much. And I'm going to ring the bell and uh, we can stay, keep, keep on going. So here we go. Thank you. We got it. Thank you so much. And we're going to stay for some more of you. <laughs> You all, you can unmute your mic and ask questions, or you can use the chat bar, whatever you'd like to do. Yes. Britt, I have a question. Uh, if, if the heroin is the main source of uh, income for the Taliban, uh, it, would it be uh, impossible to, to, for the military to, tr to destroy those fields to, uh, to cut off their source of, of finance? That's a great question, and it has been tried. Um, that has been part of the uh, sort of e economic building. They actually early on, the United States and the, and the uh, international community tried to get the Afghans through incentives to go out and destroy their own fields. Uh, what, what I did not realize until I got there was really how big this is. This is millions and millions and millions of, of acres of of poppy fields and the security environment inside those inside those areas with the Taliban threat, the ISIS threat, the the tribalism, the warlords that that they're also as dangerous as as the Taliban. Um, that on one day they're they're in Kabul as a minister of something, but yet the next day they're they're cultivating heroin out in the fields the next day. And so these individuals it, it is such a big problem that there's not a, a, a will among the United States nor the international community to try to do that type of uh, destruction, uh, to go out and, and destroy those. You know, in Colombia, we tried uh, spraying for the, the coca plants and that would, had minimal success. And this is a thousand times bigger than the, the Colombian coca fields. That's really how big we're talking about. So wow. what, we, what we tried to do early on meeting with the Australians and the Brits and the, some of the other European countries is we've tried to say, look, this is 85% of this heroin 
even though you're is mostly going to Europe and mostly going to Australia, you know, they need to have a will. They need to put their money up front to 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 try to take an effort like this because it will require military response as well as a as a uh, a destruction response by the by the locals. Oh, right. Thank you. There was actually a point where they, uh, as crazy as this sounds, they paid money to Afghans with machetes to walk through these fields for years and paid millions of dollars for the sum, whoever thought that was actually going to have some real impact. Uh, it was just a total failure, and yet we still spent way too much money on that effort. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they didn't do that during harvest season. Oh, I'm sure people slipped it in their back pocket. Crazy. All right. Well, thank y'all. Uh, I'm, I'm glad if there's anybody else, I'm glad to hang around. Randy, thank you for setting this up and appreciate your assistance and your introduction. Oh, good job. Always leave them wanting more. You have. <laughs> Look right. out. That's All right, right. guys. Y'all yeah. take care. Great seeing y'all on screen, and uh, we'll be back to normal soon. That was good. Thank you, Britt. Bye bye. Thank you, Britt. Bye, Vernon. <laughs> Joe, Bernie tell went. Linda hello for me. Vernon? Joe, tell Linda hello for me if you get a chance. Okay. See y'all later. All right. Thank you, Brett. We appreciate you. Thanks all your help, Jackie. You're fantastic. Glad to. Glad to. Tell tell all the family hello. Will do. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks and thank you so much, Jackie, for all that you do here. We got we got a good one, I think. Got thank it. you, Joe. You got it. Bye. Okay.